Good morning. See, everybody made it in okay with all the rain and flooding and everything else that's going around this, uh, this morning. But happy Mother's Day to all our mothers and, and mother figures out there. Because uh, sometimes we know that, that uh, sometimes you were mothers to people that weren't your own kids. So, uh, or grandkids even. So, happy Mother's Day to everyone. And we open our worship this morning in, in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are there any announcements that we need to make this morning? Um, we do have Mother's Day flowers for uh, all the mothers uh, uh, to take home. And you can plant them, you can keep them in the pot, whatever you like to do with them. Um, if you want to keep them alive or whatever. Uh, but... Um, the girls will hand those out, I think, after the service, either if you're going out right after church or if you're in the uh, fellowship hall for uh, uh, some coffee afterwards. Any other announcements? Oops, all right. Then let's celebrate with our opening hymn this morning. Um, it's number 62 in the United Methodist Hymnal, All Creatures of Our God and King.
done marvelous things. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Bring forth into joyous song and sing praises. Please join me in our statement of faith, the Nicene Creed, and that's found in the United Methodist <coughs> Hymnal, Hymnal 880. <clears throat> We believe, we believe in, in one, one God, God, the Father, Father the, the Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the father through him all things were made for us and our salvation he came down from heaven was incarnate of the holy spirit and the virgin mary and became truly human for our sake he was crucified under pontius pilate he suffered death and was buried on the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy universal and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please pray with me. God of songs and marvels, old and new, your powerful love for this world continues to astound us. In these days, these last days of Easter, we gather to recall the love that brought Jesus into this world and into our lives as Savior, friend, and brother. We thank you for welcoming us into your household and for trusting us with your marvelous work to draw all people into the spacious home of your love. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes from John 15, verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because a servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I'm giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. 
Our response today is surely the presence of the Lord is in this place, and that is in the United Methodist Hymnal 328. Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to gather and worship in your name. And Lord, we know that you are always with us, but we just ask for your special dose of your Holy Spirit this morning to open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to receive the message which you have for us today. And Lord, I just ask that you empty me out of myself and fill me up with your Holy Spirit. So the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart are known to be your words and not mine. We've got a couple verses of a companion passage from 1 John this morning. It's from 1 John chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah, has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. Amen. I want to ask you a question this morning, and it's probably one that, that you, it's one of those duh questions, right? How do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you're saved? Well, gosh, you know, I, I can remember back to my childhood, right? And that old song that said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Right? I know because I've learned all these things over a period of time. But when we're asked that question, sometimes we get a little flustered and we don't know quite how to answer it, do we? There was a, an evangelist named D. James Kennedy who asked two questions of those that he encountered in his life. He asked, first of all, he asked, do you know for certain that if you were to die tonight, that you would go to heaven? And you, generally he said that he would get a response, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain I'll go to heaven. And he said, fine, fine, that's a great answer. And then he said, well, let me ask you the second question. If you were to die tonight and you went to the heaven's gate, and God was standing there, and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would your answer be? Ooh, that's probably a little bit tougher question, isn't it? Because you're here, yeah. I'm here knocking at the door. Where else am I supposed to be, right? I'm here knocking at the door of heaven. Well, there's only one requirement to get us into heaven, right? There's, there's the passage that from Acts chapter 16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. <clears throat> believe in Jesus and we will be saved. It doesn't say it. There's no other commandments that talks about that. It's, that's the simple command. Believe in Jesus and we will be saved. That's the requirement to get us into heaven. And this is true that our faith in Jesus saves us. And this is also true, that our belief of that faith in Jesus is confirmed by our behaviors. What we say and what we do is an expression of what we believe. Do y'all think that? What you do and what you say is an expression of what you truly believe inside. And what we do believe 
determines our ultimate destiny. In a writing of James chapter 2, Martin Luther once said, Good works do not save a person, but a saved person does good works. In other words, our actions reflect what we believe. We don't do good works because, uh, you know, because, well, it's just the right thing to do, right? We, we do those good works. A saved person does those good works because of our faith in Jesus, and that was one of our commandments. We keep the commandments of God. You see, love is a sign of salvation. It all started with God's love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? We all remember that Bible verse from John 3, 16. The signs of salvation in a per person's life can be seen on how we live our lives. And how we live our lives shows that unwavering faith and belief in our salvation. Our time, our talents, our thoughts, our ties that we all manage for God are signs of our belief that we are saved. And notice I said, not that we will be saved, but we are saved because our salvation is a past event, right? Christ died and he rose for our salvation. People worship work, they, or people who worship work and witness show signs of salvation. But the greatest sign of salvation is our love. When Jesus charged us to love one another, he was explaining love as the greatest sign of this salvation, the greatest outpouring, how we can show our, our true belief is through his love. Loving others is how we show our love for God, and loving God is how we are saved and get into that heaven. So that answer to the question, how do you know that you'll be going into heaven, is found in those four simple letters, L-O-V-E, love. That's right, love. It's what Jesus did, and it's what we as followers of Jesus should be doing as well. We love like Jesus. You know, remember the, the bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do, right? Jesus loved. We pray and work to say the things that Jesus would say and do the things that Jesus would do. That's what it really means to love and to show that love. It means to be more like Jesus. You see, love is an obligation of salvation. Jesus didn't ask us to love. Those weren't suggestions that he made. He commanded us to love. And love just isn't an option that we can give or take for Christians. Apart from Jesus, uh, our, uh, from, apart from inviting Jesus into our hearts and into our lives as our personal Lord and Savior, it's, love is that most essential ingredient of being a Christian. That's why it's the greatest sign of our salvation. It's been said, now you can be right about every area of theology, or in other words, religious beliefs and theories, and the polity, that's in other words, how we live our lives as a Christian in Christian community. But, Wrong, but we can be wrong about Jesus. Even though we can be right about our, the way we believe and, and, the, and that theory behind what we believe and, and how we are supposed to live that Christian life, we can be wrong about Jesus. In other words, we can, we can look at Jesus and, and not quite fully grasp what it truly was about him. We can get caught up in some of those things that probably don't matter as much. But we can be wrong about every area of theology and polity, but be right about Jesus and we'll be saved. In other words, if we truly understand what Jesus stood for, what Jesus was about, we can be saved. If we truly follow in his footsteps. 
See, being right about Jesus is proved by our love. And as that song goes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. One of the phrases that best characterizes our contemporary culture is, no one can tell me what to do, right? Aren't we living in a culture that comes close to worshiping our choices, our freedoms, and our rights, and has little time or so it seems to, or maybe we just conveniently forget that true freedom requires a level of responsibility, discipline, and obedience. Now, we all know that there's a difference between the have to do something and we get to do something, right? Those have to's are things that are being compelled by someone or something else, like oh, doing homework, right? We have to do homework in order to pass a class. Or maybe paying tax when you go on, on something you bought at the store. You don't get a choice whether that tax is automatically added onto your bill or not, do you? That's a, that's a have to, right? That, that's just part of buying something. It's, that's part of what we're ingrained to do. It's mandated by our government to help support different things. So we don't get a choice in that, whether they're added or not. But those get to's are things that we see as an opportunity or a privilege such as taking a vacation or, or playing a sport for fun. And then of course there's some things like work that are a, a get to for some people and a have to for other people, right? Part of that is our perception. How do we approach it? How do we look at that? Do we get the opportunity to work? Or do I, oh, I have to work today because oh, I gotta pay our bills and this and that. And, or do we look at that as a joy, being able to do something? As people of God, how do we perceive God's commandments? Are they like have-tos for us, or are they get-tos? Have you ever thought of it that way? Do we have to follow God's commandments, or do we get to follow God's commands? You see, obedience is a, it, we have to ask that question for ourselves. Is obedience a have to or a get to for us? In the end, have to and get to are about how we perceive things. We don't have to follow God or God's commands. And we don't have to do our homework, do we? And we don't have to pay our taxes, but... If we don't do those things, there are implications for our choices, and we may not like the outcome, and it might not be an outcome that we really want. It seems like we have some generations as defined by society in or coming into adulthood that has a little conce uh, conception of what obedience or other than that rejection of the idea as a whole of any type of obedience. You know, what, what's that famous line? Obey? No way! I'm my own boss! Right? Nobody else is a boss of me! I'm my own boss! Well, that's not quite true in life, is it? You know, most people are happy with the love part of our passage today, since love is frequently looked at as an emotion that's designed for purely our personal pleasure, something that we get self-fulfillment from. But love is often forgotten as that agape kind of love, that selfless, serving others first kind of love. You know, that love that mothers give their children, serving them and serving their needs. Have you ever noticed a mom doesn't let her you know, baby cry all night when they're newborns? That they typically feed them every couple of hours, even though they're probably tired themselves and want to get some sleep. It's that selfless kind of love that they're fulfilling there. Sometimes we seem to say, you mean love isn't all about me? Well, I'll burst your bubble right now. No, love is not all about you. Just ask any parent you know, and they'll tell you. Well, what's those famous words? Ask mom, she'll always know. Yeah, just ask your mom. Mom, you know, Really? What's love all about? Is it really about me? 
No, no, it's about doing something for someone else or loving someone else. The spiritual truth is this. Obedience is how we show our love for God. The question, like any child asks their parents, is why? Why do we love? Why should we obey God? Well, first of all, obedience grows out of our love for God. It's as simple as that. For God, for the love of God is this, that we obey his commands. If we love, if we claim to love God and yet constantly fail to be obedient to God's will for our lives, we demonstrate that emptiness of our professed love. And if we love Christ, we'll naturally seek to be obedient to God and his will and direction and his guidance for our life. Love wants to please the one that is loved. See, God delights in the obedience of his people, and those who love God will seek to obey him. Because obedience grows out of our faith. Authentic faith in God produces obedience. And as we place our faith in the Lord, we express our confidence in him. We trust that God cares for us and wants the best for us. Uh, on our way over this morning, my wife has this podcast um, uh, that's uh, from WCIC, and, it, and it's about people's lives and how God has touched their lives. And this morning, it was um, about a mother who, whose child had grown up, and, and they had missed a heart murmur until I think they were their senior year in high school. <clears throat> Suddenly, some things just weren't adding up and it wasn't feeling right and they went to the doctor and because he kept saying his, his, his tailbone hurt, tailbone hurt and, and the doctor gave him an exam and, and said, well, you know what, your tailbone appears to be fine, but you got a heart murmur. And it turned out that that was a defect that was missed and he wasn't getting enough oxygen to certain parts of his body or even to his brain. And one of his statements when, his, when he was going through this, his mom's like, oh, I'm just so sorry you have to go through all this, these medical procedures and fix this and fix that. And he said, mom, it's okay. We have to have faith that God will get us through this. And isn't that pretty amazing by, you know, someone that's 17, 18 years old having that type of a faith that knowing that God is there and will get them through it. As I said, that authentic faith in God produces our obedience and we place our faith in the Lord. We express our confidence in him that we trust that he cares for us and that wants the very best for us. If you're in the military, and Kenny, I know you're in the military, you went through a lot of important training. Training to give absolute obedience to that commanding officer because your very life could depend on it when you went into battle. You didn't have time to debate things. You didn't have time to ask, well, why should I have to do that, get my head down in that foxhole or dig a foxhole to get down there, right? You, you just did it because you were trained to do that because you knew someone was looking out for you. And that, the reason that they did that is because those soldiers, when they went into battle, knew that their very survival and success would depend on their ability to function quickly and cohesively as a group. See, God demands no less from us. He created us, he loves us, and is beyond any measure of our comprehension. If we truly place our faith in him, the result will be obedience to his word. We have our confidence that whatever God wants us to do, is truly for our best. You ever had a, a door open or a door close and you look at that door closed first and he's like, oh, that's what I really wanted. But then the door over here opened up and it truly became something that was probably better off for you or better suited for you than what you thought you wanted or led to a better or faster outcome than the option you were really looking forward to. That's the same way with our faith. We have to trust that God has our best intentions 
You know, if we look at a picture of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion and death, it's clear that he wasn't eager to go to that cross. You know, he prayed earnestly that there might be another way. But in the end, he also said, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus trusted in the Father and that knew that surely the path was the path of obedience. He would be obedient and God would win. What does your obedience to love say about you? Are you praying like Jesus? Not my will, but your will, Father? It's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? To give up what we see as a freedom or a choice and to become truly free. Because if we give up that little piece of us, we can become free through Christ and letting God lead us. So the question is, are we truly following in Jesus' example? Are we, are we truly following the way Jesus did by asking, is it my will or your will, Father? Which, I, I'm going to follow your will. This is the way it is with our Christian walk. The only path that leads to satisfaction, fulfillment, and freedom is the path of obedience. Christ calls you today to walk that path with him. Amen. Would you be in a word of prayer with me? Lord, we just thank you for always being with us, for walking side by side with us through life, for teaching us, Lord Jesus, how it truly is to love and what that truly means, that selfless kind of love. And Lord, also what it truly means to be obedient to you and to God. And that leads to the best outcome for all of us, that we know without a shadow of a doubt that we are your loved and forgiven children, and that we too have a place in heaven with you. Amen. Let's join together in our hymn of response this morning. It's number 467 from the United Methodist Hymnal, Trust and Obey.
listen to the Lord? What joys and concerns do we have today to lift up? Of course, we give thanks for all of our mothers and, and uh, those that have been mothers to us over the years. Um, if you're like me, you probably have more than one person influence your life in a motherly way. So. So, it was a surprise for Teresa. Good. You actually surprised Teresa? Well, I think we did. Good. All right. So good, good, uh, good travel and, and safe trip. So we thank God for that as well. And a good visit. Good. Any others this morning? All right. Well, let's join in our... Uh, in our hymn this morning as we center our thoughts and our prayers this morning. celebrating your love, we lift to you our mothers, those who have given us life and those who have loved us, those who have blessed us and those who have taught us. May your blessing pour out upon all these mothers who gave us birth and those beautiful, strong women of faith who have been mothers to us along our journey of life. We praise you, O oh God, for your gift of motherly love both gentle and fierce, both strong and humble, both kind and true. Where we have been so blessed, we give our grateful praise, for you have provided loving hands that have worked so hard in raising us, cared enough to correct us, blessed us in ways that we cannot fully know as children. We call forth your compassion upon every mother and mother figure who has given so much to us. So today we lift to you all those who have mothered us through our life. And Lord, we also lift up those who are in need of care and healing in our lives. Those that are named in our hearts and in our minds, but perhaps not spoken out loud. Lord, you know who they are and know what their needs are. So, Lord, we just lift them to you right now. And also, Lord, we <clears throat> lift up those who can't be in worship with us this morning for whatever the reasons. And, Lord, we just want them to know that you love them and, and have them. So, Lord, just wrap your loving arms around them and let them know that you are there and tenderly taking care of them so that they know that they are loved and not forgotten. And Father, we just thank you for safe travel and a, and a good visit with Marty and Teresa, Lord, uh, as they were, Nick and, and Karen were able to uh, spend some time with them. And Father, we just thank you again for all that you do for us in our lives, for all those that you have placed in our path to guide us and correct us and, and to lovingly encourage us in the ways that we should go. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> this is usually a time where we uh, collect our tithes and offerings. And of course, in COVID times, we've got the plate in the back. So you, you can place your offering there or mail it in or electronic and give, however. But our tithes and offerings are a way that we show that we trust that God will provide for our needs. And so we bring a portion of what God blesses us with in terms of our times and talents and ties to him. And these offerings are our response to God's love and grace to us. As the Apostle John wrote, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? 
So if we freely return to God a portion of what he has blessed us with, without an expectation of something in return, then we are showing our love to God. Let's join together in praising God through our doxology this morning. closing hymn this morning is from the faith we sing, uh, number 2223, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. <laughs> Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you always. Amen.